Welcome back to the Policy Biz Podcast. I'm your host, John Schwabish. On this week's episode of the show, I chat with the one and only Alberto Cairo, author of the new book, The Art of Insight, How Great Visualization Designers Think. And so Alberto and I talk about his process of writing the book and how he went about identifying and thinking about who he wanted to talk to and why. We talk about whether he believes in rigid rules to data visualization, and we talk about my uh, two favorite things about the book. The first is on qualitative data visualization uh, and the challenge with getting good qualitative data and how, if you're not used to collecting qualitative data, how you might actually go about do that. As you probably know, Alberto is a former journalist, so he has a lot of things to say about actually talking to people. And the other thing that we spent a lot of time talking about and what I found really interesting in the book was the possible, I'd say possible, lack of data visualization outside the U.S. and outside Europe. And we talk about why that might be and how different areas of the world might increase or improve their data visualizations. So if you're working in the data visualization field outside the U.S., outside Europe, uh, I'd be curious to hear what your challenges are and how you are creating better data visualizations. And so you can, of course, reach out to me on policyviz.com or Twitter, LinkedIn, or Instagram. So, having said that, uh, let's take a listen to this week's episode of the Policy of This Podcast with Alberto Cairo. Oh my goodness, Alberto Cairo. What a pleasure. Good to see you again, friend. It's been a while. Hey, John. Long time no see. Thank you for having me. Of course. Uh, book number four. English book number four. English right. book number four, yes. But total books number five or six? Number six, six because right. we, we, we would need to... No, number seven. Whoa. Because, yeah, we would need to count the first book that I ever wrote, which has nothing to do with visualization. That so, was when, in my early 20s. So is the Alberto Cairo box set? That's a, that's a seven. <laughs> the collected series. The collected series <laughs> with a special cover on it. It's got a exactly. special, uh, it's got yeah, a special that's... booklet that you get. That yeah, you know, in, a, in a steel box. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's great to have you on again. Um, I love the new book, um, Art of Insight. Um, so this is this book is is uh, I'd say quite different than your than your other books. Um, it absolutely wanna, is, yes. Yeah, mm-hmm. I wanna, and I want to dive into to all the kind of different pieces of it. Um, but I, I think my first question is, w- was this book more fun for you to write than, than the other books? It was more fun in the sense that it's the more, most personal book that I've written to, mm-hmm. to date, I, I would say. So in that sense, yes, it was a lot of fun. Um, it was also a lot of fun because I got to learn a lot and talk to people whose work I admire, which is always great to bring, you know, some inspiration and re-energize yourself. So in that sense, yeah, it was a lot of fun, but it was a bit of a struggle to, to write because of, um, due to personal reasons and life changes, I've uh, been uh, pushing this book. Uh, I mean, the book has been delayed for more than two years. So <laughs> Wiley, Wiley, my publisher, was extremely generous in giving me sort of like flexible deadlines and accepting my constant delays. And so it was a little bit of a struggle to get it done. Yeah. But once I was able to sit down and actually get it done, it was a, it was a huge pleasure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And what was what was your process like? So So you interviewed... Um, you know, around two dozen or so, uh, plus I would guess many others that maybe aren't in the book, but uh, designers and and developers and however we want to call whatever we call data visualization folks these days. Um, did you transcribe all the recordings mm-hmm. and go back through them? Like what? What? I mean, you, you're a former journalist, so this is probably yeah, kind yeah, of second yeah. nature for you. But what's your yeah. process? Yeah, yeah. So, well, first of all, I needed to come up with a list of people I wanted to talk to and. Mm-hmm. As I mentioned in the in the in the introduction to the book, um, that has no any system to it. It was like I, I just wrote down tons of names of people whose work I like, I like, and I was interested in uh, talking to about visualization and in no particular order. And I came up with a with a very long list, like fifty or sixty people, yeah. and I, I talked to more people. 
uh, than 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 appear in the book. I would I would need to think about what to do with those conversations. Yeah. I even thought about doing a follow up volume, like a second part of the the out of insight, and then right. with more conversations and stuff. Just because those conversations were equally enjoyable, but I had a limited limited number of pages, so I needed to choose at the end what to include. Um, but again, it's, there is no. It's not a, as I said in the introduction. It's not a systematic. It's not a representative sample of anything other than my own thinking sure. and my, my own preferences. So I first of all came up with the list, then I contacted people, and then uh, all conversations. Uh, I would not call them interviews because they were not in, really interviews. I didn't have a particular set of questions that I had, mm-hmm. that I had for people. I just wanted people to talk to me about their work and what right. they felt passionate about and about their thinking process. Um, I. I I mean, you read the book, so you know this already. But the book is not really about the work. It's right. not a. It's really not a process book. Here's my projects. Here's how I make it. It's more about the people who are behind the work. Mm-hmm. That was what what I, what I was in, really interested in. It's like who are these people? What gets them excited? What motivated them to get into visualization? What motivates them today? What are their ideologies, worldviews, philosophies, you know, passions or fears? And I was interested in all that because that that I think that life permeates our work as much as work permeates our life, and that is mm-hmm. that is the focus of the of the book. So yeah, I had all these conversations. I recorded them all. Then I had them uh, transcribed. I didn't transcribe them myself. Uh, that's a lot of work. So I hired a professional uh, to transcribe the conversations. Then I, I I wrote the conversation, so obviously there's a lot of editing involved in that. Because mm-hmm. in, in in some cases conversations can be a little bit rumbling, and so you need to give them a proper shape. And then I gave everyone the opportunity, which is not common practice in journalism. In journalism, you usually don't do this, but this is not a journalistic work. I wanted right. the people in the book to be happy with their own words, so I gave everybody the opportunity to read. Uh, my take of their words, and then help me with the editing, so people oh, okay. could be properly represented in there by yeah. by the words that appear in the, uh, the. You will never do that if you're working in a newspaper. But you know, this is a book. This is my book, and I do whatever the hell I want with it. That's right. That's yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned that this book is not really about the process. It's not about how did person go from step A to step B to step C to get this thing uh, online. And I, I, in my view of the Dataviz library, right, the books are kind of moving from the how-to books, the best practices book. You've written, you've written a couple of those. I've written a couple of those. Um, they, they seem now we've got more books on process, like Vigia Settler's book and mm-hmm. Jen Christensen's book. We've got different types of data coming out. Um, there's the Making with Data book, and, mm-hmm, and uh, mm-hmm. Diemer Offenhuber's book is out on um, data fiscalization. Mm-hmm. Do you do you see that that evolution in in the in the I guess the library of data visualization books and is that do you think that I mean you you, you talk a lot about philosophy in the book so like do you see that as a natural evolution of a of a field as it matures I I think that the evolution is not so much a linear process it's it's more a it's more a, a diversification process it's like we mm-hmm. instead of having sort of like a linear sequence of types of books. In the 80s, we had Tufti. In the 90s, we have these. In the 2000s, we have that. It's more right. that there, there's a broader spectrum of types of books that we have today. We have, obviously, we still have the we have still have the basic principle type of book, right? It's right. like we have practical charts uh, by Nick Desborats recently, right? Yep. Which is an excellent it's an excellent basics book, and there is always going to be a need for books that remind the community about some basics of how we do things and why we do things the way we do them. But there's also books about history. There's also books about, you know, uh, sort of like a meta, uh, meta reasoning about visualization, philosophy visualization, um, and then books about the people who create visualization, like the mm-hmm. like the Art of Insights. Again, not, not focus on the process, but more focus on the people. So I think, I think that this, uh, th- that's the evolution. It's like these sort of like more diverse spectrum of, of types of books. Yeah. Um, you also, and anyone who knows your work isn't going to be surprised by this, but you also spend time throughout the book refuting this idea that there are rigid rules. You should do this. You should do that. You should, you know, do this or not do that. Are there any rules you think that, that 
practitioners should follow or is it all bend them and then break them sort of things? So, I mean, the way that I, the way that I explain this in the book is not that there are no, there are no rules. What I say is that there are no rules that are universal. It's like rules or ways or heuristics or ways to behave and ways to act are greatly dependent on the context, are greatly dependent on the goals, are greatly depending on what you want to do. There are certain, I would say, very general principles, if you want to call them, I would Mm -hmm. say. For example, I want visualization to be a truthful endeavor, right? We should Mm -hmm. always strive to represent our best understanding of what the truth is, which may differ. I mean, people may approach the same data in different ways, and that's perfectly fine, Um, or interpret a data set and represent the data set consequently in different ways just because we interpret it differently. So there's even not a rule in there other than try try to do your best, but what I explain in the book is that what really matters is that is, is perhaps we should we should do is to stop thinking of visualization in terms of principles and rules and start thinking about visualization or more broadly the data analysis process as more a sort of like a reasoning process. It's like you need to give yourself and give others reasons that are sound and that can be understood by others. And you need to be able to rationally justify and logically justify the reasons that they, that that took you to to make a particular thing or to do a particular thing in a particular context and you mm-hmm. should be able to have that conversation so that i would say that that's the general principle it's like base your decisions on that type of reasoning and do you i'm guessing that's how you approach your teaching that the that the theme or the thread through your classes is it's about yeah. reasoning it's not about Step yeah. A, step B, or even I mean, I, in a linear way. Yeah, even when I explain basic stuff, such as, for example, why is it advisable that bar graphs start at zero, right? Mm-hmm. I, I can explain why. I mean, I can explain right. the reasons behind that. Right? It's like, and and I, I, I try to walk students through that reasoning. And... Um, and whenever I, I need to grade students, I, I don't like grading. Whenever I need to give feedback to students, what I ask, yeah. what I ask students to do is to be able to provide reasons for every choice that they make. Why did you use this particular typography? Or why did you use this particular color? Or why are graphics arranged in this particular way? I may disagree with the reasons given for that particular mm-hmm. choice, but at least we can establish a conversation mm-hmm. and they can give me those reasons. Then I can give them back my reasons and then we may be able to reach a consensus or not. They may see mm-hmm. the uh, whether my, my, my reasons have <clears throat> any merit to them or not, and then they may follow my reasons or they may stick to the reasons, right? So right. It's, like, it's all about the conversation at the end. And this conversation can be based on as I explained, the out of insight, it can be based obviously on experience. It can be based on what you have observed that works or not throughout the years. It can be based on a growing body of empirical evidence that, that we can all use and draw from. Mm. But in some cases, it can be just based on taste. And, and many yeah. decisions in visualizations are based on taste. And that's right. perfectly fine as long as you make that clear and straightforward. Do you think this the back to the back to the the point about the the evolution of of books? Uh, do you think that's part of the evolution of the field? I mean, in like the modern the modern sort of work on data visualization, we have you know kind of the tufty few camp of rigid rules that uh, you've written about in the past about how they are are or are not based on anything more than preference. And now it seems we've moved towards this more of a reasoning, a logic. There are uh, there's more, there, not more, I would, there's some aesthetic decisions that are, that are kind of, you know, more embraced by the field rather than these rigid rules. Is that, is that, do you think part of the evolution of the field yeah. or the diversity? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a sign of maturation. It says that yeah. we are, we are reaching a point of um, higher uh, or deeper maturity, which is a good thing. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I found really interesting. So there, there are two for me, um, Two two uh, threads in the book that I found really really interesting. Um, so first is on qualitative data viz. Um, mm-hmm. You discuss it several places in the book. Many of the people you talk to do a lot of really incredible stuff with with qualitative data uh, data viz. Um, I'm I'm curious whether you think qualitative data viz has kind of gotten the short 
straw in the field in terms of instruction and, and practices and approaches? And if so, mm-hmm. like, how, how do we how do we deal with that? Well, we deal, I mean, and it has not been as, as covered or as deeply covered as quantitative visualization simply because it is harder to teach it systematically. Right? Yeah. When, when we teach quantitative data visualization, it's easy to teach it systematically because you can you can talk about the grammar of graphics, right? You have you have a set of numbers, but data is not always numbers, obviously. But you know, let let let's speak loosely here. So we are you have a set of numbers or quantities, then you have a set of objects, and there are certain uh, grammatical uh, principles that teach you how to map those numbers onto those objects, and then vary certain properties of those objects in proportion to the numbers that you're representing, mm-hmm. which is the mm-hmm. core of the grammar of graphics. So that is very easy to systematize. But how do you systematize the teaching of, let's say, I don't know, Jaime Serra's work. Jaime is one of the designers Mm -hmm. that I showcase in the book who is famous for producing these beautiful illustration-driven visual explanations. So how do you systematize that? You really can't, right? You can talk about vague heuristics and sort of like principles of composition and organization of information, but you cannot systematize it as, as deeply or as strictly as you can with the case of data visualization. So I think that in part, the reason why we have not paid so much attention to qualitative data visualization is the fact that it's it's easy to write about it. it oh, yeah. Sorry, it's hard. It's hard to write about hard it. Write it. About, yeah. it's, it's easier to write about data visualization than it is to write about qualitative uh, visualization or visual explanations. Fortunately, I mean, we have more and more, we have books uh, that deal with this, or did you mention Jan Christ- Christensen's book? Um, about science infographics, so she does that uh, yeah. very thoroughly, but it's hard work. Yeah. Do you think I, one of the arguments I've been making in in uh, other places is is the is the idea that quantitative researchers, and that could be at any level, mm-hmm. need to be more qualitative in their work. They need to actually talk to people, right? And you, as a journalist, like that's oh, like yeah. second nature to you is like talking to people. Mm-hmm. Do you think from a data viz practitioner perspective, people need to be more willing or able to go out there and talk to people behind the yeah. data? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's one of my, actually, that that's one of the things that I may want to write about in the future. Uh, so there, I have several ideas already bubbling in my brain about future projects that I may want to undertake, and that is that is one of them. And we have several examples in the uh, several examples in the book. For example, um, mm-hmm. one of the chapters um, is about a uh, Federica Fragapane, the Italian visualization designer, and she has this beautiful project about uh, refugees who cross mm-hmm. the Mediterranean Sea. Who cro- first of all, who cross Africa, half of Africa to reach the yeah. Mediterranean Sea, and then they cross the Mediterranean Sea. So obviously okay. you, can, you can represent that quantitatively, um, and, and you can show their paths, and you can show you know, how many people cross through here or through there. And she, that, she, did, she has done that, but what she did in this particular project was to trace the paths and tell the stories of, I don't remember how many, like seven or eight, yeah. Uh, specific migrants, specific um, uh, uh, refugees. I, and it's a wonderful project. It's still a visualization, but it's highly qualitative, qualitative in nature mm-hmm. because it doesn't just show you the hard facts. It also shows you, let's say, how the hard facts reflect and reflect back onto the lives that are being represented in yeah. those hard facts. And I think that that is wonderful. That's a, that's a wonderful trend. So I, I think that we need, to do, we need to do much more about that. I mean, we need to sort of like realize that a data often represents people. And in order to understand the data, we need to understand the people behind the data or being represented by the data because data sometimes doesn't capture the uh, the complexity, the entire complexity of the lives of people being represented in the numbers. It, it's interesting because when I, in the past, when I've talked about this and I've interviewed other journalists about this <clears throat> journalists are always like well you, you go and you you go talk to people and you 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 have this conversation and you ask them questions but but they don't get to the part of how do you actually talk you know find the person to talk to so if someone's <laughs> listening to this show and they're working on their data visualization about you know whatever it is what would your recommendation be to find the person or the people to actually talk to to get that 
you know, that, that, that insight into what the data actually mean for people's lives and experience? Well, I mean, as everything in visualization, it will greatly depend on the type of topic that we are we're talking mm-hmm. about. But for example, uh, let's say that you're doing a story about, you know, the recent onslaught of legislation against trans people here in the United States, right? Mm-hmm. Which is a newsworthy story nowadays, sadly. So it is very easy to maintain the discussion at the data level, at sort of like the objective level, right? It's like, right. How many people are trans? How many people are receiving gender affirming care? How many people this? How many people that? Are there, let's say, side effects to gender affirming uh, treatments? Whatever, whatever. That's the objective part of that. Mm -hmm. But you don't gain an understanding of how that reflects into the world unless they talk to actual trans people. Right, right. Because they will tell you all this legislation has absolutely nothing to do with our well-being. It's just Mm -hmm. politically motivated gender affirming care is perfectly safe it has been tested it's not anything particularly new it's just been presented because you don't know crap about all this stuff <laughs> but we do know a lot about yeah. these and we can teach you about it so how right. do you select the people to talk to well i guess that again every story is different but you will go to organizations uh that can help you uh, put yourself in touch with people who know much more than you do about the data you need to, to strive to be, let's say, representative with the people that you choose. So there's an interplay between the objective level and the subjective level, right? You need to try to represent in the people that you choose, sort of like try to represent the samples that are being reflected in the in the data. But there are no really clear cut rules for these. It's all, yeah. all very, you know, yeah, it's it's a difficult process, obviously. Any yeah. journalist can tell you that. And very often we fail. At, at, at choosing our choosing our subjects is because we don't we can really not do representative samples in, yeah. in interviews, right? But but your point of of reaching out to organizations and other groups is is finally what I realized after talking to I mean countless data journalists is like you don't go to some bar and random. Oh no, you no people, right? a you diner. Don't... You go to a diner yeah. and find people to talk about <laughs> politics. Right. No, right. The, 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 I mean you can do that, but it's. Yeah. I mean it will be obviously biased because it is not the same thing to talk about uh, people in a diner about politics in Miami than it is to do it in Minnesota. Right. Yeah. This is not the right. same thing. Right. Obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so 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 the first part uh, that was that was particularly interesting to me was on the qualitative data. Uh, Viz. The other part that was particularly interesting to me uh, was on, uh, I guess, the possible, maybe the actual lack of data viz outside the U.S. and Europe. I thought the uh, the the chapter with Mohammed Waked was really mm-hmm. uh, illuminating on, on this point. And, and uh, so I wanted to ask you, given that you've talked to so many different people, what do you? Th- so first off, do you think there's a there's a lack outside the U.S. and Europe? And if so. What is holding people in those countries back? Is it is it the technology? Is it the data? Is it just the training? Like, what is it? It is a combination of factors. One of them is the lack of the lack of data, <laughs> the lack of mm-hmm. trustworthy and reliable data. It is yeah. hard. It's hard to produce this type of work in countries like uh, Egypt or or China. Right? I yeah. for for the book I talked to uh, one of my former students. Uh, Catherine Ma, her chapter didn't make it to the book, but eventually I will do something about about it. Uh, and she talks about that challenge in China. It's like, how do you get proper, reliable data? Right? It's like in, in different places, right? Or in the book, you can read about uh, Attila Bat- Batorfi from Hungary. And mm-hmm. he, he talks about a COVID tracker that he developed uh, in Hungary uh, at a time when the Hungarian government was not provided right. uh, reliable data. So they essentially they needed to create their own data, gather data right. from different sources, uh, talk to experts, handle the data. So that's a common challenge. I mean, if you talk to people, for example, um, a, a newspaper called La Nación in Argentina, uh, they had you know, long experience creating their own data sets to visualize just because the Argentinian government is not very prone to putting out, you know, good, good, reliable data. So that that's one of the that's one of the challenges. <clears throat> the other challenge is also is, is related, I think, to, let's say, networks of support, so re, self-reinforcing networks of support. 
Uh, in many cases, uh, the people I talk to in in other countries other than the U.S. or the United Kingdom, etc., they are they feel a little bit lonely. It's like I am the only mm-hmm. one doing this type of thing here. It's just a small group of people. So there is not a mass of people who are producing this type of work, and that is the reason why uh, some of them. You mentioned Mohammed, but but he's not the only one. They are trying to work as ambassadors, as educators, trying to spread the word, try to bring more people in, trying to persuade people that visualization is not magic. It's something that anybody can learn and you should embrace it and start practicing it. Once you have that, a critical mass of people, naturally networks of mutual support will start growing as it happens, for example, in the US and the UK. Obviously, I mean, a, social media can help a lot with that. Mm-hmm. Um, in finding people who are like you, and but it's not the same as having a, sort of like a local network of support, yeah, sure. the people you can meet with. So that's another, yeah. that's another challenge. Also related to networks of support is like the support of companies. It's like the fact that companies in other countries or or governmental organizations or non governmental organizations in other countries may not be so inclined to invest money and resources in creating data visualizations. For different reasons. First of all, lack mm-hmm. of funding could be a huge problem, obviously, They ha- and they have other priorities to invest in. But in other cases, it could be just lack of knowledge. They don't know mm-hmm. what visualization is for. They see it as something whimsical and something secondary in comparison to other goals. They have not been shown or they have not understood the value of a uh, visually presenting data to themselves or to other people. So it's a, it's a huge number of factors, I think, and they are all interrelated. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I wanted to to finish up. You just mentioned social media. I wanted to follow up with your view of what's happening in the field, uh, particularly with respect to to social media. I mean, I, I think for for many of us in the field, uh, well, I'll just speak for myself. I guess I, I it's the um, kind of the 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 Twitter space has sort of fallen apart. And, and, you know, I made a lot of, you know, you and I met through Twitter. I've made lots of friends through Twitter in the mm-hmm. field. And, mm-hmm. and I'm wondering where you see it now and how you see at least data, the data viz community sort of evolving over the next couple yeah. of years, I guess. I, I honestly don't know. I, I feel myself a little bit uh, intellectually impoverished by the, um, by, by the demise of Twitter. Yeah. Uh, of the yeah. Twitter space, just because I am not exposed to as much visualization as I used to. Yeah. Uh, just because yeah. of that. It's also because I must admit to the fact that I have, um, a, I have essentially removed myself from social media spaces. Other than, I mean, I'm still in blue sky. I still post, mm-hmm. you know, every now and then on LinkedIn. But there has been an, a conscious effort on my part to remove myself from uh, social media spa- uh, spaces uh, because I, I want to focus much more deeply on several things that I'm working on and that requires a lot of time in terms of reading, mm-hmm. studying. And social media is uh, is very time consuming. It's a lot of fun, <laughs> but it's yeah. very time consuming. So I honestly don't know. I hope that, for example, a platform such as Blue Sky will pick up. Um, I try to be active in that platform on Blue Sky. Uh, LinkedIn also, but I don't know what will substitute a uh, Twitter as a, sort of like a platform for conversation, yeah. finding new voices, uh, finding great projects. I honestly don't know. Uh, at the moment, I have no idea. But what do what think, do you think? I mean, I, I I don't know. I mean, I I've, I've been playing around with different platforms and ideas. I mean, I I think um, you know the Data Visualization Society is is one place where you see still yeah yeah, yeah absolutely mm-hmm. but yeah but, you know, even there yeah. mm-hmm. but even there it's on Slack I mean Slack is you know it's really yeah. hard I think you know yeah it is um, hard uh, you know I I think I, I'm wondering I was going to ask you but I'm wondering how the conference the Data Viz conference space will evolve now that we're maybe moving past the pandemic is that going to be a place that will you know we used to have a, a lot of great conferences and a lot of them uh either because of the pandemic or other reasons have have sort of stopped so mm-hmm. i'm curious about how that will change over over time so i don't know i i i will say that i uh, i agree with everything you said but i i do miss it and i miss those conversations and not always about you know a chart or, you know, Mm -hmm. a a, a visualization, but Hey, you know, and have a conversation about something else that like, 
kind of yeah. turns into like, Plus how would you get the data to do this thing? Yeah. 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 I miss those two. Yeah. I don't yeah. know whether, I don't know whether conferences will, will go back to being what, what they were. Um, some of them are coming back quite strongly. So for instance, yeah. in March, in March, I'm planning to attend and speak at the, um, a NICAR conference, which is uh, the investigative reporters conference, yep. which has a huge data journalism and data visualization component. And that, seems to be pretty healthy <laughs> yeah uh, that as, one seems as far as healthy. i know yeah for sure yeah. Um, yeah yeah i mean you know the data viz society will have their uh yeah. outlier conference in outlier yeah 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 in june maybe may or june um yeah eventually i will start i will start organizing conferences again myself here in miami or hosting right. them because yeah, you were the doing the, the Miami... Uh, I was doing Viz, yeah, Viz UM, which is a, a small visualization conference. I hosted a, a tape tapestry at some point. I hosted mm -hmm. Computation and Journalism, which I will host again. Um, I want to help uh, bring back Malofiege eventually, mm -hmm. um, the infographics conference, but that may not happen until 2025 or something like that. So I don't know. I mean, I guess that it will all depend on how much energy people are willing to devote uh, to, to, to bring in this or, or, to, or to ideate new ways of right. making making connections. Honestly, I mean, I, I do want to keep organizing conferences here in Miami, but more and more I feel that what I really want to do in the next few years is to um, perhaps not being so visible, uh, mm -hmm. perhaps staying in the backstage a little bit, doing editing, book editing, then reading, thinking, etc. Eventually, write another book at some point, mm -hmm. and 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 helping bring other voices to. I mean, younger people who can yeah. you know bring fresh ideas and try to think what are the next steps. Maybe conferences are not the answer. Maybe social media is not the way. So, what are the ways? I don't know. I'm old. Yeah. In, in, <laughs> People who are younger might know much more than I do. Perhaps TikTok will be the next platform. Who knows? Perhaps. Know. Yeah, perhaps. perhaps. Things things that you and I aren't going to even be able to follow. Yeah, and that's fine. We can yeah. just, you know, cultivate our gardens or something. <laughs> that's right. We'll just, and, we'll just and enjoy yell life. kids from, our, from the front lawn. We'll just, we'll just, we'll just yell. And just exactly. Shake our <laughs> yeah. uh, Alberto, it's always good to see you. Good to chat with you. Uh, congrats on the book. Um so for those uh, who don't know, um, how can they find you? Where where should they look for you? I mean, obviously the book they can get anywhere, all the major booksellers. Yeah. But yeah. if they want to see your regular, are you are you gonna are you gonna keep blogging? Yeah, um, I will keep. Yeah, I wish I should update my blog at some point. But you know, I'm still on Twitter, so I still visit Twitter every now and then. I don't post much on it. I am on Blue Sky. I'm I'm on LinkedIn. Obviously, my blog is still active, thefunctionalart.com. Uh, my own website, albertocairo.com. I I'm planning to add um, a, a calendar of talks at some point also to the to the website. So yeah, I'm still active online, even if I am not as crazily active as I was uh, two or three years ago. I'm still around. Yeah. I still check Twitter. I still check Blue Sky, LinkedIn. So yeah, they can find me there. Yeah. All right. So that's where you can find Alberto. Alberto, thanks again. Art of Insight. How great visualization designers think. I'm loving it. Uh, Thank you. And uh, have a good start to the year. Thank you. You too. Thanks to everyone for tuning into this week's episode of the show. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Alberto. And I hope you'll check out Alberto's book, The Art of Insight. I've also put an entire list of books and people that we talked about in the interview on the full show notes page at policyviz.com. You can check out a more curated list of notes in your podcast provider app, but if you want the full list, you can go over to policyviz.com. And if you would be so kind as to rate and review the show on your favorite podcast provider, I would really appreciate it. That enables me to find better and more guests to bring to you to learn so you can learn more about data and data visualization. So until next time, this has been the Policy of This Podcast. Thanks so much for listening.